So the question is, like, you think about those three examples, and there's many more, but just think about those three, lighting, writing, and transportation, whereas we were totally reliant on animals for those, mm -hmm. and then new inventions rendered the use of animals totally obsolete. So the question is, can we do something similar? with the food industry, where for thousands of years we were, we've been reliant on animals for food. But can we create a lower footprint way that mm -hmm. is more efficient, that's cheaper, that's better, better for the planet and better for us? And I think the answer is yes. Hey everyone, this is Greg and Liz Conley, your nutrition and mindset experts here to teach you to be the CEO of your own life. This is the Trifecta Podcast. For this episode, we've got Paul Shapiro, the CEO of The Better Meat Company. And we're gonna be talking about the super hot trends in cultured meats, what's going on with his business and the industry as a whole as we dive in. So, Paul, you wanna kick things off with telling us a little bit about yourself and what you have going on with the company? Greg, Liz, great to be on with you. I am the CEO of The Better Meat Co. and I hope I'm the CEO of my life. I don't know, I'll, <laughs> I'll talk to my wife about this and see what she says about that. Uh, but I, I like to self-perceive as the CEO of my own life as well. So Love it. Yeah, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, but to answer your question directly, Greg, let me put it this way. The planet is not getting any bigger, right? Humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself is not getting much bigger. And a primary way that we leave that footprint is through our food print, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. It just takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and more to raise billions and billions of animals for food. And so the problem, of course, is that meat demand is going up, not down. It's going up not just because people want more meat here in the U.S., so that is true, but it's going up also in places like China, India, Brazil, where a lot of people are demanding more and more meat as they escape poverty, they join the middle class. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, we want people to escape poverty, but a side effect is a much heavier footprint on the planet. Then when you consider the fact that there's 8 billion of us today, and by 2050, presuming no catastrophes between now and then, there's going to be 10 billion of us. And we're not gonna be farming the moon, we're not gonna be farming Mars, we have one celestial body to farm. So how are we gonna make all this meat? There is no way that we can satiate humanity's meat tooth, so to speak, without deforesting the rest of the planet, having runaway climate change, there's no way we're gonna mm -hmm. meet the climate goals that we have without having some reduction in the number of animals we use for food. So you could just ask people to, you know, eat plants, right? eat hummus wraps, bean and rice burritos, lentil soup. These are great foods. I'm not dissing these foods at all. I like those foods. Yeah, I was going to say we make some of those. Yeah, yeah. good. I'm sure Trifecta <laughs> makes the best lentil soup on the planet. But people want meat. I mean, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, we could walk and bike more. So mm -hmm. why are you worried about making electric cars? Well, people like driving, you know, you yeah. got to make cars that don't run on fossil fuels. We need to make meat that doesn't rely on animals. And so then the question is, how do you do it? And yep. there are a variety of ways to do it, just like you can make energy without fossil fuels in a lot of different ways. Wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, et cetera. Those are all ways to make energy without fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a variety of ways to recreate the meat experience without animals too. And that's what I think we're gonna be talking about today, which is either plant-based, mycoprotein-based, which is fungi proteins, or even animal cell culture, where you can create actual animal meat uh, without the animals themselves. So at the, at the Better Meat Co., which is the company I run, we're focused on mycoproteins, which is fungi fermentation. I've also written a book about this space called Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World, which focuses a lot on the uh, cultivated meat or animal cell cultured meat, which I hope we'll get to talk about too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've actually read your book uh, wow. several years ago, yeah. Liz, I'm so honored, thank you. Well, I'm glad you read it a few years ago. I recommend buying a new copy and reading it again today and maybe oh, getting, really? getting copies for your friends too. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say there were revisions. <laughs> He's like, we're on the fourth edition. Yeah, actually. yeah. Actually, uh, you know, I, I should say there is a new edition coming out. Uh, Simon and Schuster's putting out a paperback edition of it in April of 2024. Nice. So don't yet go out. If you already read it, don't don't go out and read it again. But uh, in April, there will be a new edition. But you can buy the book anywhere books are sold. Nice. Yeah. And in the book... Uh, it sounds like was prior to you launching the business. So you were just kind of surveying the market of all the businesses out there, what's going on, et cetera. Give us, give us the quick download on the book. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in short, Greg, what ended up happening was I had been devoting my life to this vexing problem of how do we feed humanity without destroying the planet? Mm -hmm. And I had thought for a long time that public policy was the best way that I could spend my life toward that end. Mm -hmm. And so I was working on a lot of state and federal campaigns to pass laws or defeat bad bills that related to improving food sustainability. Um, I, around 2015, I started 
worrying that maybe food technology and food innovation was going to do more mm -hmm. to uh, solve the problem that was, again, animating my life. And I started thinking about other transitions because, you know, our species used to be a lot more reliant on animals for certain things, right? Mm -hmm. We used to rely on horses who we had to whip to get them to transport us around. Yep. And, you know, we didn't stop that because laws were passed against horse-drawn carriages. We stopped because cars were invented and they're a much better way to and transport themselves. And they out-competed horses. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In fact, they weren't even car. They weren't even called cars at first. They were, you know, horseless carriages, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, same thing with our lighting. We used to light our homes with whale oil. Uh, we harpooned whales for literally centuries, um, and nobody stopped because they cared about whales. They stopped because kerosene was invented and was a much cheaper, cleaner way yep. to light our homes. For millennia, the way that we wrote was by live plucking geese and nobody stopped live plucking geese because they cared about geese. They stopped because metal fountain pens were invented and it was a much more efficient way to write. You could, you don't have to stop, dip your quill into an inkwell and so on. Like metal fountain pens are just dramatically superior. So the question is like, you think about those three examples and there's many more, but just think about those three, lighting, writing, and transportation. Whereas we were totally reliant on animals for those mm -hmm. and then new inventions rendered the use of animals totally obsolete. So the question is, can we do something similar? with the food industry, where for thousands of years we were, we've been reliant on animals for food. But can we create a lower footprint way that mm -hmm. is more efficient, that's cheaper, that's better, better for the planet and better for us? And I think the answer is yes. That's why I wrote the book Queen Meat, because I wanted to explore that premise. But in writing the book, it really chronicles the entrepreneurs, the investors, the scientists who are all racing to commercialize slaughter-free meat. Mm -hmm. And I came to realize that many of the people who I was writing about were kind of the same as me. They cared a lot about this issue and this is how they decided that they wanted to tackle the problem. And so while I envisioned myself more as a chronicler of what they were doing and I thought, oh, these must be these genius entrepreneurs who, I, you know, had MBAs from Harvard. Yeah, you saw and you were yeah. like, I can do yeah, this. Yeah, that, that's yeah, pretty yeah. much it. I was like, well, they're dumb just like I am, I guess. So uh, <laughs> I thought, well, you know, instead of writing about the people who I think might solve this problem, maybe I'll just become one myself. And mm -hmm. so I still do write. I write for newspapers and magazines. Um, and and I, again, like I said, I'm putting out a new edition of the book, but I decided to start my own company, which is uh, was started um, in 2018 with uh, my co-founder, Joanna Bromley, and um, we've been running it since. Amazingly, five and a half years later, it's still going. Yeah, and you've done, I want to say, several TED Talks as well, haven't you? Uh, I've done a number of TEDx Talks. They're on the TED.com website. Mm -hmm. uh, I did one just recently that you can go and uh, see about the future of meat uh, and how I think that fungi fermentation is a pathway to uh, to getting around this problem. So it's not the only pathway, but I think it's a really important one for reasons that I'm sure we will talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't do the cultured meat at your company. It's di it's different, right? We work with those type of companies. So they oftentimes need like either a scaffolding or they might need something that they can hybridize their animal cells with. And so our, what is called mycelium or fungi proteins can be useful in that respect. But okay. we don't grow animal cells ourselves. No. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So okay. t yeah, talk us through just so so the audience can understand the difference between you know the three types of proteins you laid out and sure. arguably the two that are in the press yeah. the most right now which is you know what you guys are doing on the mycelium side yeah. which is commercialized and you know pricing viable today yes and then cultured meat which I think a lot of people and I'll be candid myself included are kind of have a little bit of heebie-jeebies about of like okay is this something I could eat yeah. uh, right. you know and for you know, Liz is a great example, who's a, a you know, 14 year vegetarian and doesn't eat meat because of the ethical reasons. And right. literally before you coming in here, I was debating with her. I'm like, okay, you know, would you eat it? You know, she would absolutely eat your protein. But the question right. is like, would she eat a... Would I eat cultured protein? You know, and like, it, I mean, you have to... You can't not try it, like yeah. at least try it, right? But Yeah, well, let me put it to you this way, Liz. You and I have a lot in common because I also stopped eating meat primarily because I was concerned about animal cruelty and I mm -hmm. uh, did that in 1993. So it's, oh, wow. so it's been 30 years. Okay. Oh, wow. And I have eaten cultivated meat several times. And the, oh, reason, cool. the reason is because 
there's not animals being harmed to make it, mm -hmm. right? Like if your concern about meat consumption relates to, well, you know, violence against animals, right. you don't have to be concerned about this. If you have other concerns, whether you think it's unhealthy or you, you know, have a whatever religious else. reason yeah. or whatever it is, that's a different yeah. matter. Um, but if your only concern is you're seeking to avoid harming animals, it's, it's fine food to eat. The problem, as you, Greg, are correctly pointing out, is it's not really on the market in any meaningful way. So even mm -hmm. if you might have the heebie-jeebies about eating it. Yeah, it's a thousand dollars a pound. Yeah, you that's what I was going to say. How, how much yeah. would, you right. know, did you get like a backdoor into this? Or are you spending like a thousand dollars to take a bite or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would not spend a thousand dollars to take a bite. But when you're writing a book about it, they want to feed it to you so you okay. can write about it. So uh, okay. yeah. that's how I have eaten it many times. And I've eaten it maybe like a dozen times right now. So maybe $12,000 cool. worth of food is coming. How, how was it? Um, I like sense. it. So first of all, if you like meat, you'll like it because it is meat, right? right, right this right. is not a meat substitute. It's not a meat alternative. It's actual animal meat. Okay. And it's good. I like it. I, I don't have like a deep burning desire to eat it. Like I don't really care. But just to be frank, it's not for vegetarians. Right, right. right. Like it's, cultivated meat yeah. is for meat consumers. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it, it would be like saying like, you know, electric cars are for people who really love bicycling. It's just, that's not who it's designed for, right? Mm -hmm. It's designed for people who want meat. Yeah. And this is a good way to, again, satiate the meat tooth without having to raise animals. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to talk about the heebie-jeebies also when we get to that. But you asked me <laughs> earlier, which I kind of skirted around to just describe the, the yeah, few different things. Yeah, give us the breakdown so, of the differences. Right. Yeah. So 99% of the uh, alt meat market right now is plant-based meat, right? Mm -hmm. Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods, those type of companies. And what they're doing is taking plants, soybeans, peas, or wheat are the primary three crops that are used for this. And they're transforming them in ways that make them taste like animal meat. So mm -hmm. basically it's a process known as extrusion, which is basically a lot of pressure and a lot of heat. And you then transform a, a soy protein or a pea protein or a wheat protein into what's called a texturized vegetable protein. That's texturized to mean texturized like animal meat. Mm -hmm. That's how you get a Beyond Burger or an Impossible Burger or Gardein or other products that are in mm -hmm. that vein. And that's nearly all the product that's out there. Then you have a different category altogether, which is mycoproteins, myco mm -hmm. meaning fungi. Mm -hmm. And that is a different kingdom. Plants and fungi are not the same kingdom at all. They're totally different kingdoms and very different nutritional properties, different textural properties. And the giant in that space is called corn, Q-U-O-R-M. Corn has been around mm -hmm. for 30 years, right? So this is a very mature company. They have several hundred million dollars in revenue a year. And they are primarily though in Europe. So I was recently mm -hmm. in London and I went, I walked into KFC to see what was on the menu and they had corn chicken next to the KFC chicken at the same exact price. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. I thought, I, I couldn't believe I was witnessing this. Price parity in KFC on the menu is really incredible. So uh, the difference is what you're doing is you're not growing mushrooms, you're growing mycelium, which again is the root-like structure of fungi. Mm -hmm. And that has one, oftentimes a much more meat-like texture than mm -hmm. plants or mushrooms do. And it's very high in protein. So what my company, The Better Meat Co. does is grow mycelium for B2B ingredient basis. We're not seeking to be a CPG brand here. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to compete with corn or even beyond or impossible. We're an ingredients provider. In the same way you might go to Cargo and you can get soy protein or yep. pea protein. You come to The Better Meat Co., you get fungi proteins. And we can supply folks to do one of two things. Either make totally alternative meats or you can create hybridized meat where you take animal meat like a burger or a nugget or a sausage or a dumpling and hybridize that meat with our mycoprotein so that you get not only better nutrition but of course a lighter footprint on the planet too. Mm -hmm. So that's the first two categories. The third is cultivated meat which is actual animal cells. And this is not science fiction, right? This is science fact. Like we can grow actual animal meat outside of the animal yeah. and it's, you know, there's over 100 companies in this space right now. Billions of dollars have gone into this. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it still is far away from making a dent, right? right? So you can get plant-based meat or even mycoprotein in thousands upon thousands of supermarkets right now. You can get cultivated meat in zero supermarkets right now. It's just really far away mm -hmm. from actually being on fast food menus or big box grocery store shelves. Mm -hmm. um, the leading company in the space, and by leading, I mean the company has raised the most amount of money. It's called Upside Foods. They uh, their COO recently said in an interview that they are going to have product on supermarket shelves by the year 2030. Oh, so wow. you're so not. We got some time. Go. Exactly, <laughs> and that's that's the economies of the product that's causing the problem, right? It's so expensive to grow like a pound of this. 
it, it, meat that you know there's no way anybody would buy a thousand pound burger or a thousand dollar burger in the grocery store type thing that's part of it but even if they would they're not technologically capable of doing that yet at, because at large you need scale. much yeah. much bigger uh cultivators so yeah you know basically these foods are grown in cultivators just like a fancy way of saying something that looks like a fermenter basically mm -hmm. um but when you're talking about animal cell culture you know, most of the time that's done at a very small scale. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, the bottleneck for them is that they need cultivators that are orders of magnitude larger than anything that exists today in this okay. space. Mm -hmm. So even if you had a bunch of people who, in the same way people are willing to spend a quarter million dollars to go to space for a few minutes today, even if you had those people, like there's not the infrastructure available for that experience yet. Mm -hmm. right. So what you're talking about, Greg, is like, you know, things that are commercially available today, mycoprotein and plant-based protein, those are years in front of mm -hmm. cultivated meat, which is still not anywhere near industrial commercial scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what on the mycoprotein side, walk us through how you guys are producing it. Because yeah. I mean, oh, I would assume, fun. I mean, you guys have some pretty big clients at this point. I would assume you're having to produce it at, you know, reasonably large scale at this point, relatively quickly. Yeah, so, we, we wish how, how do we grow the the you know the fun guy? Like yeah, what's what's going into it? I wish we were at larger scale. Gosh, that's exactly what we need. We are you know the biggest problem for us is supply, not demand. Mm -hmm. uh, however, um, think about it like this: you know, imagine that you want to grow a barn full of chickens, right? You start out with little chicks and you feed them and they get bigger and then you harvest them, right? That's sort of it's a euphemism for slaughter. So, all right, that's one thing that you could do, right? Well, we're not growing chickens, we're growing microbes, mainly microbial fungi. Mm -hmm. And our farm is a fermenter. So it looks like a micro brewery, right? It looks like mm -hmm. a craft brewery. You walk in, you would think that if you knew about breweries, you would think it looks like a brewery. In fact, the a lot of our team members are people who come from the beer brewing industry. Interesting. So, we're not we brewing. We have a fun staff. Yeah. 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 We do. But the we're not brewing alcohol. Mm -hmm. We're brewing protein. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, we can take a tiny amount, like the chicks, so to speak, and you put them in the fermenter. Again, it's a stainless steel fermenter. It looks like beer brewing. And just like with beer, you feed them sugar, right? That's what the microorganisms to make beer are. You know, in that case, it's a Saccharomyces organism. In our case, it's a fungi. But either way, they're eating sugar, and they grow just mm -hmm. like the chickens grow. And unlike chickens, though, who take over a month of feeding them before you get chicken meat, or unlike a pig who takes about six months, or unlike a cow who takes more than a year of feeding, mm -hmm. we can go from inoculating our fermenter to harvesting our fermenter in less than one single day. Less than a single day. And that's because at the microbial level, things happen really fast, right? The larger the animal, generally speaking, the larger the replication time. So it takes a cow a long time to make more cows, it takes mm -hmm. chickens less time to make more chickens, it takes rats and mice even less time to make more rats or mice. But when you get down to microscopic levels, it's, you know, it's like this. Like you're They're banging so, them out. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> you're going so fast. So for us, we can go from inoculation to harvest in less than one single day. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge environmental benefit, right? To be able to produce food way more efficiently, way less land, mm -hmm. uh, way fewer greenhouse gas emissions, obviously without the ethical concerns about the treatment of animals. And the benefit is that you get a product that as a single ingredient, as a whole food on its own, is not only textured like meat with virtually no processing whatsoever, but on its own has more protein than eggs, more iron and zinc than beef, Mm -hmm. It has more potassium than bananas, more fiber than oats, and it naturally contains vitamin B12, which mm -hmm. is typically lacking in plant-based foods. Yeah. So in this case, you get the nutrition of meat that you want, protein, iron, zinc, but you get the things from meat that you don't want that aren't in there. So mm -hmm. no saturated fat, no cholesterol, and it's packed with fiber. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about meat, the reason why meat does not have fiber is because, you know, animals like us are made out of, we have skeletons that hold us up. Plants and fungi don't have skeletons. They have fiber. That's yeah. what holds them up. That's the skeleton of them. So there's no meat on the planet that has even a single gram of fiber in it. And fiber deficiency is rampant. More than 90% of Americans are deficient in fiber, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, probably around maybe one to less, probably less than 1% of Americans are protein deficient. But 
uh, nearly everybody is fiber deficient. And so the problem is like, you know, fiber deficiency obviously associated with things like constipation, but also colon cancer and, and heart disease. All kinds of other problems. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you want more fiber, mm -hmm. right? Like people, they look at a product and they look, see how many grams of protein in there. And, and that's fine. I do that too, actually. But you really got to be looking at fiber too. And that is a really important part of our metabolic health is ensuring that we're getting enough fiber. And so with the mycoprotein that we grow, you get not only the protein that you want, but you get the fiber that you need. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest challenges that I have. I mean, <laughs> fiber is easy as a vegetarian, but yes. uh, the protein is, is such an issue. It's so hard to get that in throughout the day. And then the other thing is digestibility, like you mentioned, like across so many different items that are available now, some of them are great and some of them are pretty tough on your stomach. So um, I think I read you have like a 0.96 out of one. <laughs> it was like... I was like, what does this mean? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Liz, it's a, it's a great uh, point. So if you think about protein digestibility, which is really important, um, there's a, a, a scale called the PDCAS scale. It's basically an adjusted score for how digestible a protein is, how complete, so to speak, is the protein. So, you know, for people listening to the Trifecta po podcast, they probably already know this, so I won't go into too much depth, but the point is that there's a variety of amino acids. Some of them we can't make on our own, so we have to eat them. Those are called essential amino acids, right? And so some of them your body will make on its own, no big deal. So this protein digestibility score looks at the completeness of a protein with 1.0 being the best thing that you can get, which is typically something like an egg white protein or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so for scale, like mm -hmm. beef is about a 0.91, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and the so micro I'm killing it with my egg whites. <laughs> but the, but the uh, digestibility score for our mycoprotein is around 0.96. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, so it's better than beef. Yeah, 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 right. So it's like near yeah. perfect, right? I mean, there's nearly no foods that have that type of a digestibility. So yeah. highly digestible, non-allergenetic, and very high also just in its protein content. So you're going to mm -hmm. complete protein, again, that's comparable, if not superior to animal-based meat. And in a way that has the things that you don't want are not in there. Again, saturated fat, cholesterol, and so on. Yep, makes sense. So what is the barrier to scale then? I mean, we've got uh, some tacos here that our Michelin star uh, head of culinary, you know, put together for us with the food. Yeah. So we'll do a taste test in I a couple wait. minutes here, which, which will be amazing. Uh, but like what, what is preventing i mean it sounds like you guys can turn yeah. the product relatively quick is it just demand yeah. people don't know it exists no it's not demand uh, at all it's quite the opposite it's supply mm -hmm. so think about it like this greg we have one acre and we have a crop on that acre that is magical everybody loves it everybody wants it but we need a thousand acres right mm -hmm. to supply the demand and so our acre is a fermenter Mm -hmm. We have a fermenter that we run in Sacramento that is about three stories tall, and we can churn out a certain amount of mycoprotein from there. But we really need something that is like 15 to 20 times bigger. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So we need a lot more fermentation space, and that's capital expenditure, right? Like mm -hmm. that's stainless steel. That's all the things you need to run a fermentation, any fermentation, mm -hmm. whether it's beer brewing or protein brewing. You need boilers. You need chillers. You need air compressors, right? Like there is a whole infrastructure around fermentation that you need in order to run a successful fermentation. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest constraint for a company like ours is just capital, right? Like mm -hmm. we have to be able to build bigger fermenters and produce more product. So what's give us an example of what the capex would be on like a large scale, yeah. you know, fermenter. It, are, are we talking like five million or like fifty million? No, it's closer to fifty. But it's not just for the fermenter; it's the entire mm -hmm. system, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a whole variety of things that go into servicing the fermenter, harvesting mm -hmm. the fermenter, and so on. The fermenter mm -hmm. itself might only be five million, but everything else is going to be more. So it may not be as much as fifty million, but you're definitely talking about an eight-figure investment, mm -hmm. and that is uh, you know a difficult thing. Uh, a few years ago, venture capitalists were more interested in capex and in these infrastructure projects today a lot different in a down market like we have today mm -hmm. you have a much tougher time for startups that are looking to do like industrial infrastructure mm -hmm. okay. yep yep makes do total you sense to be more on like the science side or are you more on the business side because i know you mentioned you have a co-founder right um yes i do have a co-founder her name is joanna bromley and um i oftentimes will say that i am maybe the face of the company she is the brain of the company okay. mm -hmm. um saying her Okay, yes, yes. <laughs> Wait, am I the face of the brand? <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to think about that. 
But, you know, uh, we have a team of wonderful scientists, microbiologists, fermentation experts, engineers, and so on. And these people are so smart and they do such an amazing job mm -hmm. to help optimize our system. It's really a, a matter of like deep science in order to figure out, you know, e beer brewing itself is a deep science. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you get into protein brewing, it is really a, a deep science. And yeah. so the product that we make is all natural, whole food, single ingredient, non-GMO, etc. But it's a lot of science that goes into it. And um, so we hire people who are a lot smarter than I am to uh, be able to figure out how to do that. And That's I, the way to do it. Yeah. That's the way to do it. I, I have found time and time again in my life that the key to success is surrounding myself with people who are smarter than I am, like over and over again. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm still trying to shake, Greg. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, do we want to try them? Do we have some of them here, Jay, that we can we can test out? Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, I would love to get some some taco action going. So give us give us the background on these uh, okay. these tacos. You guys are about to try mycoprotein tacos. So these are tacos that have okay. a single ingredient alt meat in it. It is mycoprotein that has been seasoned with taco seasoning. But that's it. That's the only ingredient. Now, of course, you guys have pico de gallo and lettuce, and it looks like uh, cilantro on there too. Mm -hmm. But this is pure mycoprotein. And so if you think about many plant-based meats, a lot of them have a lot of ingredients in it. Uh, this is just strips of mycoprotein. So it came out of the fermenter, we chopped it up, and we put taco seasoning on it. That's what you're eating. That's so really beautiful. Good. And so some people are super into farm to fork dining. I say forget farm to fork, it's fermenter to fork, all right? Fermenter That's how to we fork. do it. Beautiful. Yeah, it, it it does have a very, I would say, like chicken-like texture to it. And nice. I, I mean, how big is it when it comes out? Like, do you, you guys really have to chop it down quite a bit? Um, when it comes out, I would say it actually, it's not a matter of big. It looks more kind of like applesauce. And then what we do mm -hmm. is we squeeze out the moisture and mm -hmm. then chop it up. Beautiful. Yeah. What do you think? It's supposed to be a taste test. I'm just mowing it down. Over here. Yeah, no, I'm very good though. Yeah, I'm I'm genuinely impressed. I yeah. mean, you you think like fungi and mushrooms, and I I mean I candidly really do like mushrooms. You know, Interesting. I, I eat cremony mushrooms and all kinds of stuff all the time. But yeah, yeah. So the this is this is a different like very flavor different. and texture, and it's yeah. very different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the non biologically initiated, think about a mushroom like the apple on the tree, right? It's mm -hmm. the fruiting body of the fungi, mm -hmm. whereas the mycelium is like the roots of the tree, right? So you're talking about a very different part of the organism. And in this case, you know, we are fermenting fungi mycelium that is much higher in protein than a mushroom, which mm -hmm. has virtually no protein and has a much more meat like texture. Mm -hmm. Got it. And do you, does it produce the actual fungi as well? Do you guys have to like get rid of the, the mushrooms no, in the we, process? No, we don't produce any mushrooms at all. Really? Yeah. Wow. That is phenomenal. I've already eaten lunch and I'm still going to plow through this thing. Plow, plow away. You're getting your protein, iron, and zinc here, Greg. I know. I'm so impressed, Liz. Good for I you. I was so hungry yeah. and it was really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely impressed. This is, yeah. this is quite good. We, we'll have to look into some tacos for the trifecta menu. Hell yeah. The trifecta tacos. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can't even like place it. It's Maybe because I haven't been eating meat for so long, but it's delicious, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I felt the same way when uh, I'm, I'm buddies with Ethan that, that launched Beyond Meat. Yeah, Ethan and, Brown. Yeah. Um, when I first tried Beyond Meat, I did feel like it was like a different thing as well. It wasn't like, oh, this is different or worse or better or anything than a burger. It was like a different thing. And this, That's this, interesting. Yeah. yeah, but it still tasted very good. And this, this, I would say, is the same thing. It's like... Yeah, so it's funny you say that because I, I think a lot about this, whether the goal is mimicry of the product or mm -hmm. just something that tastes really good, right? Yeah. It's it's not as if, you know, cars mimic horses, right? It's not mm -hmm. like people are like, hey, I want a, a, a synthetic horse that it goes faster than a horse. Mm -hmm. Like they came up with something that's better, right? And so, and the same is so with fountain pens, right? Like a fountain pen is just better than a quill. It's not identical. It's not like they came up with a way to make something that looks like a quill, but isn't a quill, right? And in this particular case, what I think is important is to have something that of course is nutritionally superior, right. but that people really love eating and critically is cost competitive. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. 
And so if you think about what motivates food decisions, why people buy the foods that they eat, obviously taste is number one for most people. Yeah. Uh, price is going to be number two. And for many people, not everybody, but probably people listening to this, nutrition is going to be a big part of it too. Yeah. And that's our goal is to compete on all of those. Yep. No, it makes, makes perfect sense. And I mean, my vote would definitely be think of it as a different category by itself. That That's obviously one of the challenges we have is when you're making meal prep, especially when you're making millions of meals a year like we do at Trifecta, uh, you know, you're constantly scrambling for ways to keep things exciting. You know, yeah. if you just have chicken and beef and, uh, you know, a few other categories, you know, obviously we can try a different fish, but it's predominantly chicken, beef, uh, salmon, you know, occasionally a white fish. We'll get... Occasionally, we'll get some game meats or something in there, but for the most part, it's it's difficult to keep it exciting yeah. when customers are continuously getting you know the same spread of protein. So I think us like diversifying the portfolio of proteins is is the I mean that would be my vote is that's like the play and the way to think about it. I totally agree with you, Greg, and I actually think that's the way of the future. Like if you mm -hmm. think about the past, like protein basically was synonymous with like a hunk of flesh from a once living animal's body, right? That's what people thought of protein mm -hmm. as. But in the future, I think protein will certainly still be fat, but it'll also be protein from plants, protein from fungi, protein from cell culture. I think there's going to be a much more diverse portfolio of proteins that people associate with the foods that they eat than what we've thought about in the past. In fact, I like to to think about a future where it'd be really cool like imagine right now you might go to see your friend's house and they have like a bread maker or an ice cream maker on their kitchen counter like what if you had a meat maker like mm -hmm. you could buy like little tea bags full of cells and you drop it in and the next day or two days later you end up getting your own like home brewed meat right there mm -hmm. like wouldn't that be cool yeah. I mean, that would be like a really awesome invention i hope somebody does this yeah no i, I think it's a phenomenal idea and it's uh yeah, I mean, the more categories we can expand into. I mean, you, you think about the big metrics, and I'm sure you know these better than I do, but there's something like 1.4 billion vegetarians who don't want to be vegetarians. Oh, they, just, yeah. Yeah. they just don't have the financial capability to be able to afford meat. And, you know, I'm sure over time, especially if you did it like homebrew style, <laughs> which is what you're talking about, yeah. you're going to give them a meat option that can be, you know, potentially even more cost competitive in the future than, than yeah. you know, animal proteins. Yeah. Right. That's the goal. If we don't get to cost competition, I, I think it, it's not going to become mainstream in the way that it needs to. Like we're mm -hmm. racing against the clock. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we sustainably feed people without destroying the planet? And there's not a pathway to doing that that doesn't involve competing on cost. Um, in fact, price parity may be insufficient. You might need to be cheaper. Uh, so in you know the same way that kerosene was a lot cheaper than whale oil, if it had never been, we'd probably still be harpooning whales today. Yep. Uh, so we need to come up with methods of protein production that are cheaper, more efficient, more sustainable, and even more delicious than what we have now. Yep, yep. Okay, so let's let's pivot real quick since you are a global meat subject expert. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, to, like that. and, and we, we want to get as much out of you as we can. Uh, so on the, the, the cellular meat that we were briefly talking about, uh, is the, really the cost component, is that the large bottleneck in the market right now? I mean, have they, I would assume they haven't done any large scale market close. testing because we, we did a test here at Trifecta where we put an Instagram post out that was a picture of the cultured meat, a piece of salmon on it. What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? And okay. that's what kind of spawned the idea of us doing this episode in the podcast. Interesting. And we, you know, said it, you know, posted it and it was kind of a question post of like, hey, would you eat this? Yeah. And holy cow, was it a controversial post? I mean, holy fish. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thousands of people were liking it, hundreds commenting, nice. fighting with each other in the comments <laughs> of whether they would eat it or not. You know, right. it was, I would say, for whatever reason, I, I would consider your product like not nearly as controversial. Course, you know, right, it's yeah. like for some reason there's this big controversy around, you know, are we selling our souls to the devil <laughs> if we are, right. you know, making meat that is not 
actually coming right. from an animal. Yeah. yeah. Is it the newness or is it yes. actually something about it? Yeah, look, I, I think people are afraid of things that are new. At least some people are. You guess some people are early adopters and they love the new things. But, you know, some people are afraid of things that are new. Yeah. So I would look at it a few different ways. The first is think about the meat that we produce today, right? Like, imagine if you had said, instead of would you eat this salmon? What if you had said, would you eat meat? that came from a bird who was genetically selected to grow so big, so fast that they couldn't even walk without falling down. They grew up in their own manure. They lived wing to wing with tens of thousands of other birds. They were pumped full of antibiotics. And when it was time to take them to slaughter, you don't want to know what happens next. Like if you had said that, people would say, oh, disgusting. I would mm -hmm. never eat that. Yet, of course, that's 99% of the chicken people are eating today. Um, yet then imagine if you had said, hey, here's a clean alternative that is identical to animal-based meat, except you have less food safety risk. Because you think about meat, the reason you have to treat raw meat like toxic waste, right? You know, if you put a separate part of your basket in the supermarket, if raw meat touches your kitchen counter, you have to disinfect your counter, you gotta wash your hands. Uh, the reason is because there's feces on the meat, right? Like it, there's E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, these are all intestinal pathogens that can sicken us if we don't literally cook the crap out of the meat. That's what you're doing, you're literally cooking the crap out of the meat. But imagine if you had clean meat where you didn't have to worry as much about E. coli or salmonella because you're not growing intestines at all. You're just growing the muscle that you want and you're not growing the intestines. So there wouldn't be as much of a risk of intestinal pathogens. In fact, mm -hmm. you'd be more likely to contaminate it with your own hands than it is to contaminate you. Mm -hmm. And if you ask that question, of course, it's gonna be a very different question, a very different answer rather. And the same is so in how you word it. If you tell people, oh, this is lab grown meat, you know, who wants to eat lab grown? Like it sounds yeah, like it's- Yeah, anytime you say lab grown. Right, yeah. of course, I mean, ignore the fact that virtually every food that we eat today, like had some R&D in a lab that went into it. Right. Um, but if you tell people it's cultivated meat or clean meat, which are the preferred terms by this industry, you end up getting a much different response, a mm -hmm. much different response. Um, but in the end, it will just be called meat because that's what it is. And this happened also in the 19th century where for thousands of years, the only way that people had to get ice before was out of nature. You, there was a big industry of they would harvest ice from these northern lakes and put them in insulated boats, ship them around the world. And that was a huge industry, what became known as the natural, the natural ice industry. Mm -hmm. And then enter the advent of refrigeration. And all of a sudden you had a new way to make ice that wasn't by nature, but rather was made through human technology. It was mm -hmm. called like man-made ice. And the natural ice people were so livid. They were so upset that they railed against what they called artificial ice. And they told people, don't buy this, it's unnatural. It goes against God. It could sicken your kids. You don't want this. And of course you fast forward to today and all of us have artificial ice makers in our homes. We call them freezers. We don't think there's anything unnatural about it at all, despite the fact that it's an extremely recent invention. Mm -hmm. uh, but we love them. We love them. And we don't even think there's anything unnatural about it. And we don't call it artificial ice. We just call it ice. And I think that now people might call it cultivated meat. In the future, I think it'll just be called meat. And people will be glad that we can produce meat in a way that is safer, more sustainable and more humane than the way that we did it in the past. Mm -hmm. So while there will always be some people who fear anything new, and of course, there's a lot of people who fear anything new. That's fine. They don't have to be the early adopters. But there's a lot of people who would like to find a better way, a better way to make meat that doesn't involve degrading the planet, tormenting animals, uh, creating so many food safety problems and more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Makes sense. And obviously, they're going to get people like... PETA and uh, you know, other animal right activists are immediately going to be on the side of, uh, you know, I, I, we're going to have to think of a better word for it than lab grown meat. Uh -huh. Cultivated, Cultivated meat. meat. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah so that, that's right. I mean, look, anybody who is concerned about animal welfare should obviously support this. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, for folks who also are concerned about the fact that the meat industry is a leading contributor to climate change, deforestation, wildlife extinction, uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic amplification risk, antibiotic risk, the list goes on and on and on as to why you would want to do this, whether you care about the suffering of animals or not. Um, you know, just from a antibiotic alone, look at this, like, you know, over 70% of the antibiotics that we produce in the United States don't go to fighting infections in humans. They're fed to farmed animals to help them grow faster. We mm -hmm. pump chickens and pigs full of uh, antibiotics so they'll grow faster. And of course, that is not good for those animals, but it's especially 
risky for us because you have a, a antibiotic resistance problem mm -hmm. where people are increasingly resistant to the bugs are resistant to antibiotics because we're putting so much of it in farmed animals mm -hmm. that you end up having this problem in human medicine as well so yep. the reasons to try to divorce the meat experience from animal slaughter are many for animal suffering or not uh, but I do agree with you that people like uh, you're mentioning people for the ethical treatment of animals. Sure, of course they support this. Why wouldn't they? Um, but a lot of people uh, would also support it for other reasons, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Makes perfect sense. And I'm sure the, the vegetarians of the world are going to be on board. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm here for it. So out of curiosity, um, personal research, uh, what like food products could we find your products in okay uh yeah i'm grateful that you're asking this so the better meat co for example uh sells products to purdue farms the chicken company and they mm -hmm. uh do a blended chicken nugget it's a hybrid product so it's 50 percent chicken 50 percent plant-based and it is called purdue chicken plus that's in thousands of supermarkets and um it's a product that has you know just as much protein but less fat less cholesterol fewer calories etc um that is one thing we're also partnered in joint development agreements with um for for example, companies like Maple Leaf Foods, which is the largest meat producer in Canada, and other major meat producers. The biggest partners of ours are meat industry customers. That's so interesting. Uh, because okay. th there's a lot of value in hybridizing meat with these products. They mm -hmm. make the meat healthier, tastier, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. Um, but you can also just do it straight up like you had in this taco, a mycoprotein taco. It's delicious. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you awesome. sell just the straight mycoprotein to any brands? That's yeah, we don't make any finished goods. Mm -hmm. So we are a B2B ingredients company. Mm -hmm. So we sell mycoprotein, we don't sell finished goods. We've done some limited time offerings at restaurants just to showcase the versatility of the mm -hmm. ingredients. So like we've put a mycoprotein steak in a steakhouse and even mycoprotein foie gras into French restaurants. Oh, wow. Um, but okay. yeah, it's interesting. Like, Next leveling it. I yeah. Love it. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. It's like foie gras is illegal to sell in California because they have uh -huh. animal welfare reasons. And so it's the only legal foie gras sold in the state. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's got an angle, you know? Yeah. I yeah. love it. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming out. I mean, this is hugely informative. I feel like I like understand the space even better now. And obviously it's, you know, it's a hot space uh, from the climate change elements to, you know, animal welfare. Uh, I think after the Arnold uh, documentary and mm -hmm. all the yeah, game you know, the, changers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Game changers, uh, you know, all the pushes to, you know, plant based in general. Uh, it's it's awesome to see new businesses building better solutions for people. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. And you know, I grew up worshiping Arnold. Uh, I watched all of his movies. Us I had like a, I had like an Arnold T-shirt when I was a kid. I wore that thing all the time. Uh, my parents almost killed me because uh, one time we were in LA and somebody told me that Arnold was on the other side of the street. And so like I ran into the street and I don't even know if he was there or not. I have no idea. But I ran into the street and almost got killed by a car. Then I almost got killed by my parents for doing that. So when Arnold came out and started advocating that people enjoy a less meat diet you know he himself is not a vegetarian but he said in a recent interview that he eats 70 percent less meat than what he used to yeah he does um, yeah, yeah. I and know. yeah and yeah. so you know I, I think the goal for uh somebody like me is not to find ways to do all or nothing the goal mm -hmm. is to help people to do better right like if you expect people to do all or nothing generally you're going to get nothing but if if people can take steps in the right direction you end up making a really big difference think about like it, even if you know people um you know even if they don't switch to hybrid car excuse me to electric cars but are using hybrids it's way fewer fossil fuels being used and the same is so in hybrid meat and mm -hmm. the same is so if somebody just wants to eat less meat in general mm -hmm. um, so i'm a big proponent of taking steps steps in the right direction. I think mycoprotein is a powerful way to help people do that. Awesome. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, thank you.